Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening. I'm Professor Rios, and I'd like to welcome you to week two of the term, Climate Change. Uh, this is an update to the previous version of this lesson, which is now more based on material outside of a textbook. Uh, please do bear in mind that these will be updated into Brightspace. And also bear in mind that there is a reading list that you should be going to inside of Brightspace. There is a module labeled, I believe it's called Weekly Reading Assignments for each week. So it basically uh, matches the week that we happen to be in. So make sure that you do that because just focusing on this lesson and on these slides and on this video is not enough. I cannot possibly cover everything that's actually covered during the week. Therefore, you might miss out. So I really highly encourage you to go to those. They were made, the, the links on that weekly assignment uh, module, they're pretty manageable. And a lot of them are videos. A lot of them are links to relatively short readings. So please make an effort to get to that uh, in order for you to maximize your performance each week, but overall during the term. Any event, we're going to begin with two, the two lessons today are oceanic circulation and the global energy balance. We'll begin with oceanic circulation first. The oceans are critical to the managing of weather, of course, and climate. You think about a hurricane, it gets its genesis, its energy, its moisture, its heat. And the wind energy is all derived from hot ocean water to begin with. So very, very important set of circulations around the world, and we'll get into that. Again, these two slide sets are not particularly long. So let's begin with oceanic circulation. So they carry heat around the globe. That's basically the purpose. Uh, you have excess heat near the tropics, and you have a deficit of heat near the poles. And ocean circulations um, carry this heat around. They determine regional climate zones. So why is it forested in New England? And why is it uh, des uh, desert-like out in California and Arizona and New Mexico, for example? There are surface currents. And to these, there are these things called gyres. These are large circulating loops uh, so you have there's five of them there's two in the pacific two in the atlantic and one in the indian ocean and so these are sort of really large scale circulations uh, the the eastern half of the circulation for example in the pacific and in the atlantic they happen to be cold the western half of the circulation they happen to be warm and so let's look at these. So there's a north, northern and a southern boundary, an eastern boundary, which again is cold, and it's water that's flowing down toward the equator. So it's coming from higher latitude. And then the western boundary, it is a warm and fast circulation, uh, and it is water that is flowing northward or toward the pole. Or if you're in the southern hemisphere, it's sub flowing southward towards the pole. So think about, you know, we live next to this warm boundary in the northeast. It's called the Gulf Stream. But if you go out to California, which is in the eastern boundary sector, the water there is very, very cold. And let's look at a map here. So here is that eastern boundary, cold, eastern boundary, cold, eastern boundary, eastern boundary, eastern boundary. And then if you look at the western boundary of the, of the notice how it's a red arrow. Uh, so that is really the big mechanism that is driving water flows across the earth, at least at the surface. Uh, and this is a big player and a big part of the climate and weather machine around the world. Again, these are called oceanic gyres. Think of them like big rotors. 
on the surface of each of the oceans. Now there's also a deep ocean. This was a surface ocean. There's also a deep ocean circulation and it's called the thermohaline circulation. You need to know what this is. The thermohaline circulation. It is a circulation that is three-dimensional. It is based on heat and salt. So that's where the thermohaline comes in. And so as the Gulf Stream cools, the salinity goes up. It gets saltier. So salty cold water is heavier than fresh warm water. Uh, and you get this thing called the North Atlantic deep water. And then you have, of course, in the Antarctic, uh, bottom water that sinks because it's really, really, really cold. Okay. And so what you get is a three dimensional surface and it's, it, it makes more sense with the image uh, coming up and here it is. So this is a thermal hailing circulation think of the red or pink. Uh, or fuchsia or whatever this color is this is surface notice how this is over this can you kind of tell. This little stripe is over this stripe, so this is a surface current. And then it gets colder and saltier and it sinks and it goes basically underneath it all before it rises up again and becomes a surface current again. And so this very complicated but very predictable set of flows is what drives climate and weather patterns across the earth. This is really doesn't have anything to do with climate change. It may be affected by climate change in the future, but this is now. This is what's driving the pattern of climate uh, in the world right now. So again, it's called the thermal haline circulation, and it is a three dimensional current system of both surface and subsurface flows of water. Now the oceans are warming. They have warmed significantly over the last 100 years. So basically some of the net result, some, some of the effects of this are obviously, this is the one that everybody hears about, sea level rise, the changing of coastlines, marine ecosystems are threatened, the oceans acidify because they absorb more CO2. When you take in water and you mix it with CO2, you create something called carbonic acid, which is a very, very weak acid, but it's still acid. And so that's what's happening to the oceans as they warm. And here's an example of sea surface temperatures often abbreviated SSTs. And if you'll notice how uneven the distribution of heat is across the ocean. So of course, you're going to have more near the equator. No big surprise there. Notice the cold current here. Notice the warm current here. Notice the cold current here. Notice the warm current. Okay, so this gives you a sense of the distribution of temperature, at least on the water surface across this Western hemisphere view. So where is the heat going? So it has been argued that the oceans are really the ones that are maintaining climate change at bay a little bit. So the ocean is huge and the oceans can store great, enormous amounts of energy. And the top two meters of the ocean can carry as much heat as the entire atmosphere above it. Think of it as a big giant warehouse. And the oceans have what's called a high heat capacity. So water heats up slowly but it cools slowly, which is the opposite of land. 
So this definition you should understand. The idea of what's called high heat capacity. I'll stop for a second so you can sort of ponder it for a minute. Think about the idea of water heating up slowly and cooling slowly. You go to the beach, Long Island, Jersey Shore, whatever the case might be. Notice that the oceans really don't get warm up until about late July, August, and September, even though the temperatures in the air might be 100 degrees in June. It takes a while for that water to heat up. It's the reason why hurricane season doesn't really get going up until about August and September. So now, so where is the heat going? The majority of the heat as a function of climate change is going into the ocean. And how does it break down? Well, the oceans are absorbing 91% of the heat. Land, five. Ice, three. The atmosphere, one, that's it. And the source for this is the uh, Working Group One Summary for Policymakers of 2021. Again, if you add all of this, that's eight, nine, and 91 makes 100. So the majority of the heat realized during climate change since the Industrial Revolution began 91% of it has gone into the oceans. So what does that tell you? At some point, the oceans may not be able to absorb much more heat. Therefore, more of it might be going into the atmosphere, which is the realm we live in. Does that make sense? So therefore, it might make for maybe stronger hurricane activity, uh, more violent extremes. I believe that is one of the fears of many of the experts who, uh, who monitor this on a daily basis. All right, so there's an uneven oceanic distribution of heat. Most of the heat is stored at the top. Uh, however, like for example, if you could magically spread the heat over the entire ocean evenly, it would have very little effect. So this uneven oceanic distribution, oh, there we go. You have right here, these are the trends from 1993 to 2020. Uh, hopefully you can see by the sploshiness of the color, how uneven it is. Even though the majority of the color that you do see is in this shading, right? From a very, very light orange to closer to red. Again, look at the map, locate the countries, the world, right? Here's the US, Mexico, South America, Africa, Australia. Again, notice how the majority of the color you see is in this shading. There's some blue. But for the most part, is warming and uneven. That's the key. And here's another way of looking at the heat and where it is going. Notice how the majority of it is, oh, look, surface to about 2,300 feet. These orange and yellow and red. Less heat is going to the deep areas, so that would be 2,300 feet and deeper into the ocean volume. This was a 1993 average, so notice how much higher than that in terms of the amount of joules, J-O-U-L-E-S, which is a measure of energy. So uneven, and the majority of it is going to the very, very top layer of the ocean. So this is significant because if a hurricane is about to form, it has more energy near the surface, which is where a hurricane gets its energy from, to get going. Does that make sense? 
All right, sea level rise. And there's going to be a whole lesson on this later in the term. Again, marine ecosystems, living communities. Think about New York, London, Tokyo, Miami, San Francisco. Uh, so many of the cities, the big cities in the world are all in coastlines. So this threatens the economy, it threatens marine ecosystems, and of course, homes, living space. Phytoplankton, which is a teeny tiny organism, and the key to this is that it forms uh, the, the, it's like a really important cog in the food chain. So if it is threatened at the bottom of the food chain, it affects other creatures above it in the food chain. And of course, acidification. Uh, oceans function as a big old sponge of carbon, specifically carbon dioxide. When you combine CO2 with H2O, you form a very weak acid, as I mentioned earlier. And this prevents marine ecosystems from fully developing their skeletal features like coral. So this is what dying coral looks like. This isn't dead, it's dying. It's called bleaching. So it's an indication of stress. Again, Australia has the largest living organism on Earth near its shore. It's called the Great Barrier Reef. It has gone through several episodes of death or dying and also some significant uh, improvement since, but this is sort of like a, a symptom of sort of a bigger problem. Again, there has been some recovery as of late 2021, so that's a good thing, but keep in mind that from 1880 to 2019, remember the planet has gone up by about 1.09, and most of this heat has been stored in the oceans. So healthy, dying, dead. So that just gives you a sense of the sort of like an ecological angle to climate change all right so that's the first lesson give you a second to get some water you can stop the presentation if you want come back to this one coming up this is a very important one this gets into the greenhouse effect so let's get into it right away So the green, the, the global energy balance. So anything's, the, the energy of the earth and what it gets from the sun can be thought of as a budget. So energy in equals energy out or approximately so. What you have is climate stability. Make sense? If what comes in approximately equals what goes out. What you have is a stable climate. Looked at mathematically, this, which is that, minus this should be equal to approximately zero. That's it. So imagine if you want to put numbers in, just pick a number 10 minus 9.999999990 means it's basically zero get it so it's a very it becomes a rather simple mathematical equation when you view it in that sense so the greenhouse effect this is important very important and please 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 do not confuse the greenhouse effect with climate change if there were no humans on earth the greenhouse effect would still be taking place. It keeps the atmosphere, it, I'm sorry, it helps to keep the surface of the earth warm 
and it is often referred to as a blanket or atmosphere effect. The average or global temperature of the Earth from pole to pole is around 15 Celsius or 59 Fahrenheit. Remember the graph last week that had the red and the blue? The zero line would be this. Anything above this would be red. Anything below this would be blue. So think back to the week one graph. If the Earth didn't have an atmosphere, the Earth would be really, really cold. Instead of 15 Celsius, it would be minus 18 Celsius, or about zero degrees Fahrenheit. This is what's happening in Mars right now, for example. Mars has essentially no atmosphere. It has an atmosphere that is one hundredth the thickness of the Earth. So therefore, the energy that comes in during the day leaves at night. So it gets very, very cold. So this is the greenhouse effect. Also think of it as a blanket. Here's a key term that you should understand, insulation. Not to be confused with insulation, what you put in your walls or inside of a jacket or a blanket. <laughs> in soul, S-O-L, Asian. So in coming solar radiation. This is the energy we get from the sun. In short wave energy, visible light. Again, in soul, S-O-L, not to be confused with insulation. Understand the difference. So here you have short wave energy from the sun. It makes it to the earth. Some of it is reflected. Some of it is absorbed, but some of it gets bounced back as a form of long wave terrestrial energy. So you, your eyeballs can see this. Go outside. Sunshine. You're seeing it. You cannot see this. Terrestrial or long wave energy is called infrared energy. Think of it as thermal energy. You might be able to sense it, but you can't see it. So because the sun is a much hotter object, it emits in the short wave radiation band the most efficient. So visible light, what you see outside. Oh, let's go back. Uh, the Earth, being a much cooler object than the sun, emits in the infrared or terrestrial long wave energy. Okay, now, you know, we have seasons, right? Days are getting shorter in the fall. Days get longer in spring. Longest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere is June. Shortest day is in December. If you go to the Southern Hemisphere, everything's flipped, okay? But energy, you know, because the Earth is a tilted sphere, as it rotates around the sun in summer, our summer, June, the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. But in the winter time, so December for us, we're tilted away from the, from the, from the sun. Therefore, the days get shorter, it, it, it gets colder. The opposite happens in the southern hemisphere. Right now, during fall, or as we approach fall, the southern hemisphere is headed towards spring, whereas we're headed towards fall. Everything gets flipped. And energy, again, incoming energy from the sun, short wave energy, visible light. And then what the Earth emits, long wave energy, infrared. So you can't see this. 
you might be able to sense it, but you can't see it because your eyeballs are not designed to see in this range. We can only see in this. Think of our eyeballs as a, as a television set with only, chat, only certain channels that you can see, right? You can see the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, what else? Blue, violet, indigo, right? <laughs> Roy G. Vib. That's what your eyeballs can see. Anything on either side of, you know, uh, either side of red, so it's called infrared, or on the other side of blue, a violet, ultraviolet, you can't see. All right, so let's look at a, at a very simple diagram about an Earth without an atmosphere. In other words, without a greenhouse effect. So this is the sun. You would have incoming solar energy or shortwave energy. Some of it would be absorbed, and then a lot of it would be emitted back. So basically, the energy that would come in during the day would escape at night. Now let's look at an actual greenhouse. Incoming solar energy comes through the panels. And now incoming energy is absorbed and it's emitted at longer wavelengths, infrared. So you can see this, but you cannot see this, even though you feel it because it's getting warmer. So the outgoing long wave energy is trapped by the greenhouse. Now, let's look at the Earth with an atmosphere. So you have H2O, gas, CO2, and methane. The big three greenhouse gases. Again, H2O, water vapor, gas, CO2, and CH4. So the same thing happens. Incoming solar energy absorbed by the surface and re emitted at long wave and then reflected back by the gases in the atmosphere. And this is that blanket. This is the greenhouse effect right here. You need to know this definition. The greenhouse effect is is the reason we exist, if you want to think of it that way. If there weren't a greenhouse effect on Earth, there would be no human life because it would be too cold for anything to develop, for plants to grow. Get it? So this is the reason why the Earth is a livable planet. And it all begins because we have greenhouse gases like H2O, CO2, Methane. And by the way, these are oftentimes you will hear the term pollutants in the media. Uh, these exist naturally without human input. We're adding to it unnaturally, but they do exist on their own. All right, greenhouse gases, they interact with infrared radiation, meaning they are infrared sensitive. And these are the these are the big six greenhouse gases, often abbreviated GHGs. So we have, of course, CO2, carbon dioxide, CH4, methane, O3, ozone, N2O, which is nitrous oxide, CFCs is a acronym for a whole bunch of chemicals that are in the chlorofluorocarbon family. And of course, the most abundant one is this one, CH2O in gas form. Now, of course, water vapor is variable. If you're in the Amazon, it's super humid. If you are in the Sahara Desert, it's very dry. 
So it's highly variable depending on where you are. But these are the big six greenhouse gases. So what does infrared mean? It is a form of electromagnetic radiation. So let's look at this. So for example, the, the deeper in this image to so the lower you are, long radio, short radio, infrared, these are considered long wave energy. None of this is threatening to human life. Radio, television, microwave, infrared, we cannot see any of this. We can see this, this little tiny sliver of the electromagnetic radiation, we can see that. That's all your eyeballs can see. And then you have ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. When you go to the dentist and they take an x-ray of your mouth, they usually put a big leather vest on you and the technician steps outside. That's because exposure to x-rays for a very long time can be very, very dangerous. Ultraviolet radiation, that can lead to skin cancer over a long period of time. And gamma rays, luckily we don't see any of these because if we did, we'd be dead. Gamma rays would basically almost instantly kill you. Very, 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 very short, frequent uh, wavelength, very energetic, deadly to humans. Deadly to humans, if exposed for a very long time, can lead to skin cancer. This is where we live. This is what we can see. And then, of course, this is the, sh the longer energy, longer wave or weaker ener energy, radio, television, microwave, and so on. So this is that. So now, wavelength is just the difference between crests. So now, if you have something that's more energetic, you can fit more of these in the same distance. So that means there's more energy packed into it. So therefore, radio is a longer wavelength. X-rays are a much shorter wavelength. Shorter wavelength implies more energy and therefore more deadly to humans. Here's a better image, I think, frankly. Uh, again, your eyeballs can see this. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. The visible spectrum, the rainbow. Anything on the longer wavelength is infrared. It means beyond red. And anything on this side of violet is ultraviolet. Here you have microwave, radio, television. Not dangerous to humans. Very dangerous to humans. Notice how much more energetic this implies it to be, right? Shorter wavelength, more repetitions, longer wavelength, lower energy, lower frequency, longer wavelength, higher energy, higher frequency. It happens more often, shorter wavelength. Amazingly enough, our eyeballs designed to see just this. All right, magnetic field of the Earth. All radiation travels at the speed of light through space. Only some makes it down to the surface as a thanks to this. Only ultraviolet, visible, and infrared make it down to the surface. 
the most harmful energy is deflected. This is a big deal if you are a pilot or an astronaut, you have to worry about this harmful energy because you're away from the, the magnetic field of the Earth. And so here is the Earth, here is the Sun, obviously not to scale. And what happens is, oh, go back. You have this sort of shield. It's sort of like if you, if it's a rainy, if it's a windy rain and you have an umbrella and you sort of point the umbrella to the side of it, you're basically walking into the rain because it's falling sideways. That's what the magnetic field of the earth kind of does. It protects the earth from the most damaging of radiation. Because if it weren't, there'd be no life on earth. It's pretty simple. Okay, what makes a greenhouse gas? Or what makes a gas a greenhouse gas? So you have molecules, more than one atom. You have chemical bonds that hold these atoms together. So bonds vibrate at a particular frequency. So you have CO2, here's C, O and O, CO2, and you have H, two O, two H's, one O, two O's, one C. So two oxygen, one carbon, two hydrogen, one oxygen. And these are the two big greenhouse gases. So bonds, that would be these things right here, they vibrate out of particular, so the light is absorbed when the vibration frequency of that bond equals the frequency of the light. And as a result, you get absorption of infrared energy. So you store it. Again, here's CO2, water. CO2 and water are sensitive to infrared light. They absorb it and emit it at the right frequency. On the other hand, the most abundant gases in the atmosphere, oxygen and nitrogen, which make up about 98.9% .9 of the atmosphere that, you know, when you breathe, you breathe in 21% of this and 78% that. Every time you take a breath, you're sucking up a whole bunch of nitrogen and oxygen. Right now, you just did. Uh, but these are not greenhouse gases because they are not sensitive to infrared light. CO2 and H2O are based on their sort of orientation, how they're sort of put together. Here's my cat. She's figured out the greenhouse effect. If you know a cat in winter, they love to go into a little area and sort of burrow. Their little body heat gets trapped in between the um, blanket. And it's nice and toasty there. It's hard to get a cat out of there. Uh, that's basically a greenhouse effect right there. So the freight of energy coming in. So energy comes in in basically what's referred to as watts per square meter. So there are a lot of, if you think of the top of the atmosphere across the entire earth, it is a really, really, really big area. So 340 watts per every single square meter. Half of it is absorbed by the land and the oceans. So again, 48%, about half. 29% uh, is reflected. 23% is absorbed by the in the atmosphere. So when you add up all these, you get 100% of that 340. Of the 48 that comes in, so of this, Now that's how it is broken up. 25% 
loss through evaporation, convection and conduction. Convection would be like a thunderstorm. And then just basic radiation, what you would feel, say, if you were hovering over a stove, right? That thermal radiation. So of the 48%, that's how this breaks down. So think about it from the perspective of energy at the top of the atmosphere is about 340. Energy at the top of the atmosphere out would be about 340. So if you do that energy in minus energy out, 340 minus 340 should be around zero. And the Earth is in balance, meaning there would be no deviation <clears throat> from that planetary average of 15 degrees. Of course, in a world of climate change, where we're talking about the Earth getting warmer, there's a little bit more in than there is out. So we're adding to this number a little bit. Hopefully that makes sense, right? If you're adding in more energy, you're bound to get warmer, right? Makes sense? So that's really where this class is headed. So upper atmosphere, most shortwave energy, ultraviolet light is absorbed by O3, ozone. In the lowest, lower atmosphere, visible light, half of it is reflected out to space, half of it reaches to surface, and is, here's a key term, re-radiated, has long wave energy, and it's captured by greenhouse gases. And this right here is why we exist, why the atmosphere is a livable system that can support life, plant growth, agriculture, food production. And that is the presentation. So starting, remember, a lot of these <clears throat> presentations kind of build on each other. So I would highly recommend that you you know, you can go back and watch them again. If you want to watch a piece of it, refer to the, um, these you can download these slide packets as PDFs. I don't recommend printing them, please. Just save them and you can sort of follow along. If you have a question, please ask. And of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, please go into the weekly reading assignments module. And there is one for each week. There are videos, there are links to a few articles. The readings aren't usually very long, but you really need to do them because simply focusing on the presentation doesn't really cover everything. Uh, otherwise, hope you have a great week and I look forward to interacting with you. Uh, I wish you well and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.